Good morning, sir. Good day. How are you? I'm very well. I am very well indeed. Uh, it is. It's been a good week this week, actually, uh, irrespective of everything that's uh, of everything that's happening. How's your week been? Yeah, quite good as well, actually. Uh, in fact, I I just saying to somebody every uh, every morning because uh, because obviously the office situation is slightly different than normal. Every morning I do a, a little brief video message to my own team, uh, and obviously we're you know first week of May is well be finished today, uh, halfway through Ramadan. And so, but no, I think the, the week is, um, has gone pretty well. I'm sure That's, we'll catch up on all the changes, but uh, yeah, it's gone pretty well so far. It's, it's funny because uh, I had a conversation earlier with a client and we were talking about Ramadan and she turned around and said, of course, it's, it's Ramadan. I didn't even notice the, the, the change because yep. obviously we, we, we see the change more than others, obviously. And uh, because we had a bit of a precursor for the month before, uh, it's, it's pretty much status quo and has been for the past seven weeks. So it's yep. been a sort of, uh, uh, it's, it's kind of been camouflaged with, it, with everything that's happening in the lockdown. And as you say, we're already two weeks into it uh, and it's going to be Eid uh, in, in, you know, the, 20, the 23rd, I think it is, 23rd of May. Yeah, right around there. Yeah. So, yeah. So, well, so, yeah. I, was, I was actually saying to my wife last night, I, I don't know the last time I went to an ATM. <laughs> um, I just, I haven't, you know, normally if I'm out in the car during the day, I'll, I'll grab a coffee somewhere or I might grab lunch somewhere. And obviously they're all closed. Mm -hmm. So again, like Ramadan during the day, if I'm out in the car, I don't, you know, obviously everything's closed anyway. So again, there's, like you say, it was a precursor. So nothing has changed for me from no. that perspective. Yeah. Just no, it's been a, a kind of smooth transition and not, not yeah. as harsh as, as we usually find it. Mm. Well, like I say, very warm welcome to Thank This you. Is Qatar, Mr. Jeffrey Asselstein. Now, I'm going to ask you a question because we've known each other a long time. Asselstein or Asselstein? Stein. Stein, okay. Yeah. It's not, it's not Charlie Sheen, as in double E. It's I N E. Okay, just right. to check it. Now, I remember distinctly, um, I don't recall if it was I requested a connection with you or you requested with me, but I distinctly remember seeing your profile on LinkedIn and thinking, wow, this guy does quite a bit. He's in the, uh, the, the recruitment sector, headhunting, I think was yep. on your profile at the time. Yep. You were also in property, you were in you know, banking and et cetera, et cetera. So you had a yep. very interesting profile. So it certainly caught my attention. And when I think about when we first connected, and I think we first met at probably a networking event officially, um, thereafter, it's been, it's been quite a journey. You've been in Qatar for how long? Uh, 13 years now. 13 yeah. years, okay. So uh, just it'll be 14 in October, yeah. Fantastic. We'll say, we'll say 14. We'll get rid of the negativity and the bad sure. luck number. We're going to 14. It always sounds better. Or you're in your 14th year, which is always exactly. Nice. Um, and always with your, your lovely wife and children, you moved everything over here at the same time, didn't you? Correct. Correct. Yeah. So where's your journey taking you to and from? Because you're similar to some family members of mine who you also know, in which you've kind of traveled the globe quite some time. Give us a bit of a, a synopsis into the, the life of, uh, of Jeffrey. Sure. So um, I'm Canadian uh, and my, I started my career. And this is when, when you start telling these stories, I, I get a horrible f reminder of how old I'm getting. In other words, my banking career started May 28th, 1990, which will be 30 years this month. So 30 years ago, I joined uh, what would then become HSBC, so Hong Kong Bank of Canada in Toronto and Mississauga to be specific. So I joined them in Canada for a couple of years. And then after, well, actually just over two years into my career with them, I joined their international program um, and then moved from Canada to Hong Kong. And then after a year or so in Hong Kong, I then moved to Oman down to Salala, which started what would end up being uh, a real love affair with the Middle East. So I went, I was supposed to go to India and at the last minute it was changed to Salala. So quite a, quite a big change from what would have been Mumbai to Salala. And then leaving Salala, I was supposed to move back to Hong Kong, but instead moved to Dubai, uh, which I'm so thankful about because I met my wife when I moved to Dubai. So that turned out quite, quite good. Um, so Oman to Salala, uh, to, uh, sorry, to Dubai for a couple of years. And then from Dubai, the first of two opportunities I had working in London, 
So I worked in London for about four years. This is all, all with HSBC, or as your father-in-law would call it, the bank. Uh, so I worked in for the bank there, and then from there to Beirut. Um, Beirut, an, another short stop in Dubai for a few months, back to London for a year. And then my final role in HSBC was in Moscow. So I was CEO for the bank there for a couple of years, which was just phenomenal. Uh, is, that phenomenal nine, is that nine placements I've just counted? I think so, yeah. So wow. it, it's Over funny span because- of how many years? It was 16 years in total. Um, and what's interesting is that, you know, for anyone that's worked for HSBC, particularly in the role that I did moving around, uh, I think I spent the least amount of time in Asia. So, you know, I spent an hour, an hour, hold on, a year and a half, <laughs> an hour and a half. It felt that quick, a year and a half in Hong Kong, but the rest was, was outside. Um, so then again, two years with HSBC in Moscow and I left them, I resigned from HSBC and joined Qatar National Bank, q and That's what brought me here. And then after two years in q and uh, you know, to be very transparent, it was the beginning of the financial crisis in 06, uh, sorry, in 08. So I came in 06 and 08. Um, unfortunately, I was made redundant uh, from QNB, finished up the 2008 in December with them and then started working for myself in January of 2009. Okay. Yeah. So you moved directly to Doha from Moscow. Did I get Correct. that right? Yes. Oh, that was a change. Yeah. Indeed. I remember sitting, you know, when you first came, you often you'll stay in a hotel for a period of time. So sitting in a, by the pool in the evening in November in Doha, thinking this is so much better than sitting in Moscow in November. Although I loved, yeah. I absolutely loved Russia. I, I loved it so much, but um, the weather I, I do not miss. No. Uh, yeah. It's not really a place, Russia, that I think people would turn around and say, oh, I've got that on my bucket list. I must go to St. Yeah. Petersburg, St. Petersburg or Moscow. It's not really talked about on a, on a touristy level. It's not talked about on the, the clashes with America and things yeah. like this. And it's portrayed in a very dictatorship sort of um, uh, manner uh, yeah. in the media. But from, from your personal experience, the people, the, the lifestyle, just give us a quick synopsis on Russia because it's uh, yeah, not many I, people have, uh, have lived there as expats. Well, I agree with what everything you just said. And, and the only thing I would add on to that is I think everyone should have it on their bucket list to at least go to Moscow. Uh, you know, I was very, very fortunate to be able to live and work there. Uh, and because of the nature of my role, got to see kind of access to very, very interesting people, interesting things to see. Um, now, again, it might be showing my age. I grew up really growing up in the 80s. So the the end of the Cold War, the height of the Cold War, depending on how you look at it. So the way I often describe it, I grew up, frankly, terrified of the Soviet Union. You know, where certainly if you're kind of growing up in the early 80s, you were quite concerned about nuclear war. As yeah. I mentioned, I'm Canadian, but I live, as almost every Canadian does, within miles of the U.S. border um, and within 60 miles of Detroit, which is where all the tanks were being manufactured. Mm -hmm. So the view is always if the Soviets ever attacked the U.S. by missile, it goes polar route over Canada into the US. And if it's about 60 miles short, well, actually didn't, 60 miles doesn't matter. We, we were all gone. We, we'd all be gone. Uh, and so we grew up with that, uh, that fear. And then to then fast forward to 2006, to think not only have I been able to travel to now Russia, but to actually live there, be part of the culture and everything. So I, I, you know, I just found it fascinating. I found the whole experience fascinating. We lived very close to the Kremlin, in fact, less than a mile away from the Kremlin. Um, wow. And, you know, I just, as you say, the, you know, you grow up, whether you grow up or even just today, there's a certain image that the, uh, that the media portrays of Russia. Some of it's correct, a lot of it's not. Um, but it's just, uh, it's a really, a really fascinating place. And um, I, I, would, I would recommend to anybody to live there. And I think it's certainly, some of the smartest people I've ever worked with in my career uh, was my time in Russia. Um, if you look particularly under the Soviets, uh, you know, the hard sciences, you know, math, science was a real backbone to a lot of their education system. Mm -hmm. uh, so you get that. And then obviously with the arts, with the music, um, you get obviously some of the 
not that I'm a massive culture vulture, and I don't want to imply that I am, but you know, if you do ever get the chance to go to the opera or to the ballet in Moscow, it's clearly some of the best in the world. Um, and it's just uh, what I what I always found interesting. Actually, quite I often say it's quite similar to Arabic or, or to our our hosts here, is that you don't learn Russian, nor do you learn Arabic by accident. You don't just pick up words because you're hanging around. So this, the, the, um, the, the chances where you look to, to bring yourself more into the culture, to understand it more, to try to speak the language, even at a very rudimentary level, again, like Qatar, is highly appreciated. So you know, I remember being in a restaurant you'd, and you'd be trying to order, and, and the, the server basically asked me, um, if I wanted something, and I said, you know, sort of what? I don't understand. And she asked me three times, and she goes, do you want bread? And I said, well, no, bread is chleb. She goes, oh, no, I was asking for a very specific type of bread to see if you wanted it. But in, as opposed to what may other countries may be stereotypified as uh, not being welcoming, I found, I found the Russians extremely welcoming. Um, and also, like, like most countries, like most big cities, you know, Moscow itself can be quite, you know, people on the face of it are quite cold. Um, yeah like you'll see in, in a number of major cities, but as soon as you speak to people, um, it's incredibly cliche to say, but you know, you really do get into we're all the same. Um, I, will, I will risk over romanticizing it by thinking of a song by Sting, um, mm -hmm. right? But you know, they love their children too, just like we do, have the same concerns just like we do. Um, but I, I thoroughly, thoroughly enjoyed my time there. Yeah. When you look at things like, um the World Cup that was in that was in Russia. Obviously, the the previous hosts to our uh, home country at the moment. Um, yep. I, I obviously watched a, a lot of it, being a, a big football fan. But I think they did an amazing job. Yep. To uh, to remove that uh, that negativity and that stigma that, that surrounds them um, and kind of follows them. And uh, many people were surprised. And I'm hoping that I'm hoping that Qatar is able to create that same uh, good feel factor um, oh, in the next couple of years 100%. by being welcoming and by being not, re not relaxed, but uh, accommodating uh, yep. to the world. Um, because I'm sure like Russia, you have um, traditions and you have rules and football and soccer travels with it. Uh, the stereotypes uh, of the people that can that can follow it and the negativity that can follow the, the football and yep. those occasions. But I think Russia did an amazing job in the hosting. I think the backdrops that were there, the fan zones that were there were were amazing. And, and I, I believe that the Supreme Legacy have actually gone, and, and of course they were in Russia, yep. as you can imagine, but they've taken a lot of positives um, from that. How do you think... Things will things will fare in in a couple of years in in the lead up. Let's say we're in the summer, which we're fast approaching. Summer twenty twenty. Yep. Um, it's going to be be upon us before we know it. But let's say summer twenty twenty two. It's literally around the corner. How do mm -hmm. you think Qatar will fare in a couple of years? Oh, I think extremely well. If we if if you look at uh, if you look at um, let's take the two before. Uh, if I remember correctly, so Brazil and um, South Africa. Is that right? 2000. Prior to Russia, yes. Yeah. So one of the biggest challenges that South Africa had uh, is you, it was extremely difficult to get people from venue to venue, the sort of point-to-point -point issues. Uh, I think Brazil had, you know, they were still kind of rebuilding the Maracana, you know, the day of, of the kickoff. <laughs> uh, what Qatar has done, I mean, they, you know, clearly we, they, we, we had a we. very, very long um, uh, notification period from when we won the bid to the date in uh, 2022, which is great because we have, obviously we have to build a lot of infrastructure into the country. Um, but if we look at where, where we're at as a country right now, uh, I'm sure you've attended some of the matches in some of the brand new stadiums. The one I yeah. attended last, this time last year, <laughs> Uh, in May, the stadium in Wakra, unbelievable, beautiful, beautiful stadium. And the fact that the Metro is now in place, the stadiums are, are coming along, um, you know, I think we'll be well advanced on, on a number of the key infrastructure items. Because I think, you know, again, if you look at Russia, Russia did a phenomenal job, but you yeah. know, between 
Moscow and other cities, they are not close by. I think that's going to be one of the great advantages. What will make the World Cup so incredibly special in Qatar will be the closeness of the venues. I when mean, the, you could literally do three matches in a day if you were an avid fan. Right. The biggest challenge for the Legacy Committee is that all the venues are so close together. I have no yeah. doubt. You know, we know, as you said, they were in Russia. I'm sure they were in Rio as well. But they would have been spending the time looking at... Um, I heard an interview with um, uh, Mr. Th uh, Thawadi, and he was saying the one thing that really caught them by surprise is he, he was referring to, say, some of the Latino countries like Argentina, Latino, sorry, uh, Argentina, where the original thought would be if they play in Moscow on a Friday, then be ready because on a Friday, you know, the Argent Argentines will, will show up. Show up. But no, no, they were there since Monday. And they were, <laughs> you know, gearing up. And then if the next match, and say, is in Ekaterinburg, they would fly out and then they'd be in Ekaterinburg for five or six days before five the next match. Yeah. And he said that the challenge for Qatar is that all the venues are here. Okay, we'd say Wakra and, and El Hor, but they're in yeah, Doha, they're, effectively. They're, they're, not, they're not 10 hours apart. Like, right. you know, I think the England team... Or I remember listening to the England team for their first match. Their training camp was at one location, yep. but their match was door to door, ten hours away. Right. I mean, that's phenomenal. That's, right. That's further than here to the UK. That's a that's a here to Miami flight. Exactly right. You know, exactly. It's, it's crazy. So I think that's that creates a massive opportunity and a challenge. But you know, that's, I'm sure we'll discuss these things whenever there are opportunities <laughs> <laughs> or challenges that can be great opportunities. You, but can I, see uh, how, you can see how far the infrastructure is coming. I mean, there are flyovers yeah. going up like you would not believe. You know, yeah. when, I, when I arrived in 2008, the, the D-ring uh, bypass was, was nowhere to be seen. It, it was there, but it wasn't in use. Sure. It was partially in use past, uh, past Salvo Road. Now you've got the entire Shamal Road that's open, and that's being extended up the way with flyovers. Yeah. You're coming left, right, and center. Um, have, you, have you been on the metro with the family? Absolutely. Oh, yeah, we, love so it. we love it. Yeah. Yeah, it was great. Yeah. It was great. We parked up, we went for dinner, we jumped on the metro, we went from one side of, uh, of Qatar to the other within the space of about 25 minutes. Yeah. And obviously no one, was, no one was on it, but I think the hardest part is going to be how many, uh, how long can those, can those uh, metros, metro trains be at any one time and how frequent can they be to get 40,000 supporters Yep. from one location of, of Qatar to, to another. And where are they going to be based? If you look at WACRA, the infrastructure from an accommodation perspective at the airport, which is less than 10 clicks away, th there's very little accommodation there. You've got the Shark, you've got a couple of hotels next to it. I think the Oasis, yep. the Oasis Hotel, and then the Marriott's being refurbished. But as an airport hotel uh, infrastructure, there's nothing really there at the moment. Yep. And I know they're working on some alternative construction methods in which, a bit like China throwing up um, hospitals and, and hotels and buildings, they can, put these, they can put these infrastructures in within about nine months. So just because we're two, two and a half years away, don't, don't think that there's not going to be an abundance of buildings going up. There's going to be sure. an abundance of pontoon hotels. There's going to be cruise liners. There's going to be, and, and I don't mean it in a negative way, but... I, there's going to be a number of cruise liners that are available because of the current situation. There's going to be a number more of so. organizations that may not be able to sustain their assets. So they're going to be offering them to, to, you know, to Qatar as a, as a benefit. And then, of course, the glamping uh, as well, which is over on the WACRA side and, of course, up, uh, up Al Khorwi on the, north of the, the yeah. north of the city as you go up, to, um, you know, up towards uh, the sort of Ras Levan area uh, and those beaches further north. So there's, there's still plenty of infrastructure to go into place, um, but the, the, the metro itself is going, to take a, is going to take a hell of a pounding, and so is the airport. Uh, yep. My understanding is that the, the, the Hamad will need to be used in conjunction with the old Doha uh, airport. They're, they're, they're maintaining that and how the flights will work. But the, the mem some of the members that I, that I knew very well, some British members of the SLC, said that the frequency of flights will be on par with Heathrow. In order wow. to get the traction of uh, people um, here, uh, at least they're not having to fly from venue to venue, but that will put different pressures on. But the people flying in, um, yeah, it would need to be the same frequency as Heathrow. What about the embargo? 
What do you think, and this is obviously speculative, uh, we haven't heard much since the last uh, six months of anything really being discussed. Yeah. Uh, at the GCC summits, there was some conversations, but they didn't go very, they didn't go as well as, as everyone had hoped. How do you think that's going to pan out in the next two years? Because I, I feel that the UAE are going to suffer by not being a part of this World Cup because surely the most obvious thing was for the world to fly in on holiday in November in 30 degrees of heat and have a lovely time in Dubai, Bahrain, Oman and Qatar, obviously, and be able to fly in and out for the matches within an hour or two um, from those locations to Doha. That's going to really hurt the GCC neighbours, isn't it? I, I totally agree. I think, um, think there would be... It's a massive opportunity cost to them to not, by not allowing the planes to fly within the, within the region, you know, in other words, crossing into Qatar. Um, yeah, I think they'll, they'll miss out on potentially a huge amount of business. Um, I think probably like you, I would assume anyway, so I think we all would love it to end today. Um, uh, and yeah. uh, and, yeah. and for, for, for a number of reasons why, I just don't, uh, you know, I, I I'm not really a political kind of person, but I just think at the end of the day, when we look at the GCC as a family, it's never good that certain family members aren't talking to each other um, the way we'd like, the way they used to anyways. Um, and, and you're right, but I don't think I've really heard anything since back in December when it was, you know, kind of widely rumored that it was all going to be over. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think, I think Qatar has done an incredible job of, of, of working through the situation and you know the fact that it's been three years almost now is, is yeah. staggering that it's that it was that long ago uh, so we've all adjusted accordingly i just still think it'd be better if everyone was getting along and i do think certainly if we're speaking of the world cup specifically then clearly you know of an embargo of the blockade continuing during the world cup we will benefit and others will lose as a result of it because yeah you're right people would holiday in these other countries um, you know, because they are so, so close. Um, it would make sense that people would look at seeing other places. And if it's not easily done, I think that'll, that'll harm the other countries. So, yeah, when you look at, um, I, I know, I believe that Dubai is now officially out of lockdown uh, in the past, uh, past week. So mm -hmm. hotels will be reopening and, and restaurants and establishments will be reopening. But because of the international traffic still not being permitted to fly into Dubai, then hotels are still going to be struggling. Now, that's going to take a couple of years to get back to any sort of level. Yep. So I can imagine that there'll be a lot of people, uh, high-level high, high people within the government in the UAE thinking, in order for these hotels to survive, we need something spectacular. And obviously, the Expo 2020 has been, has it been officially cancelled? Uh, it's been postponed to 2021. Right, okay. Um, is there a risk that the, this the week. World Cup would be postponed, do you think? Do you think the World Cup would be pushed to 23? I think we're okay. I, um, I think so again, also. What, what, what would I know? But I think we're far enough away. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I think the, I mean, the Olympics have been postponed. World Cup has been postponed. Oh, sorry, forgive me. The Expo has been postponed. Um, hopefully, it's, things will have worked themselves out by that stage. And the, Euro, yeah. the Euros as well, right? So Euros has been pushed back by a year. Um, yes, they have. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. I think the, I just wondered if it was going to have a knock on effect and that was going to be the, the whole yeah. Uh, yeah, pushback. But um, I hope not. You know, it, is it, is it, you know, is, are we really in a situation in which it's, it's A, is it that bad a thing that if, if things are pushed back or are we, are we as a, a globe, as a world society, trying to reset things and make sure they're normal? So making sure we don't constantly push things back as a reminder of of what's happening now? Do we want to try and ensure that we get back to relative normality and, uh, and not, um, not make this a, a, a global situation that is in the history books for, you know, for decades and decades? It should, it should just be a sort of short-term short -term, uh, discussion rather than a long-term discussion. I yeah. remember 50 years ago this happened and these amount of people passed away and everything changed and everything moved forward and we lost an entire year of our lives. You know, it's a yeah. negative situation, but I am, um, you know, probably I, I know I have, and I'm sure like you and like many others, I'm listening to a lot of different sources talk about 
short-term and long-term effects. Um, you know, I'm, I'm probably the least expert when it comes to discussing these kinds of things, but for, for what it's worth, I think from my perspective anyway, um, you know, there's the, the great tension we have right now, and I think you see this spilling out, if you can kind of slip through what the media's, <laughs> besides the agenda that every media has for their own personal political preferences, uh, I think the, the great desire for everyone is that everything gets to be as normal as quickly as possible. Uh, and that desire is gonna get stronger and stronger and the frustration with things being, uh, and I'm not, I'm, I'm not talking about catch or at all, I'm talking globally. I think the, the restrictions that people are under are getting more and more and more frustrating. Um, and the, the great challenge is, you know, how do you, you know, you open up too early, do you, do you risk a second kind of wave coming through? Um, the, uh, I remember it, it was one of the press conferences and I, I forget the lady's name that, that often briefs the, the US press, uh, the, the lady, um, and she, someone made a comment and she basically said, listen, this, this, this pandemic is in, call it 130 countries, I don't even know the number, of, you know, X number of 100 countries. We are all trying to figure out the answer. Uh, and no one has the answer. If you look at, you know, we often, Sweden's often quoted, Belgium has a terrible death rate, right? The worst in the world. But if you ask the Belgians, if you ask the Belgian government, they'll say, yes, it is, but it's how you calculate the numbers. And I just think, you know, everyone's, everyone's trying to find a way to, to, cope, to cope with it. Uh, clearly, you're in the office right now. I'm in the office right now. Um, you know, we're following all the rules and regulations that we're working under. 80% of our staff are not in the office, but I'm in the office right now. Um, you know, you still need to move things on. And I think the, the, if you look at the two main issues, right, we've got a health crisis and an economic crisis, and they're completely linked together. Um, and I think the frustrations of the economic crisis will force decisions which may have more of an effect on the health crisis. Um, how that all plays out, I don't know. I really don't know. Yeah, it's going to be it's going to be an interesting one. And I want to I want to talk about two things. Let me come back to the media thing in a second. But let's talk about just just very short because it's obviously a massively negative scenario that we've got at the moment. We're always putting I'm always putting disclaimers within within these episodes of of this is Qatar, where there's opportunity. Uh, arising at the moment and, and I'm all for opportunity and I'm all for the positivity. I am getting a little bit frustrated with people taking it a little bit too far and saying the world has changed as we know it. It will never go back to the way it is. No one will ever shake hands again. Everyone's going to have to socially distance for the next X amount of years. I'm, I'm, get, I'm getting a bit frustrated with that whole negativity and, and we're going to end up turning into a di dictatorship of a world run by China and the US having a war of words with Russia sitting in the middle and North Korea popping their head up saying, by the way, I'm not uh, dead. I'm, I haven't disappeared. I am here and we're, we're still going to threaten to do this every now and again. It's, it's just getting a little bit tedious. Um, there, are, there are different ways that this could have been handled. Sweden are handling it by doing um, by not having the same amount of, of lockdown or a, or a stringent a lockdown. And they're letting, they're letting things take, to an extent, it's natural course. The UK were too slow to react um, based on advice that was given from Italy, uh, France, Germany, and Spain. The US uh, is obviously still, we're not sure where their peak is. Um, the, the, the whole decision-making process for government entities is a no-win situation. I, I, I look at the British press, which we'll come on to in a second. We look at the British press in particular, and I don't mind Piers Morgan. I don't know if you know who Piers Morgan is. Piers I've, I've Morgan, been following him particularly closely. Yeah, I know, I know. But yeah. he does drive me nuts. My wife loves him. But when you get, you know, in the morning, you get Piers Morgan attacking uh, a, 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 the health minister, for example, saying you haven't reached your target of 100,000 a day. I get making good TV, but that's just ridiculous. But going back to my point about country upon country, there is positives for ways that Sweden have done it. There's positives for the ways that maybe Italy have done it with complete lockdowns. How, how, can, 
how can this be be captured? How can this be contained? And how do, how can we prevent this second wave? Are you a believer in in letting antibodies form and the the unfortunate incidents that will occur with the elderly and underlying health conditions? Or and these are personal opinions. These are no no right and wrong answers. Or does everyone go into lockdown for eighteen months? and you basically extinguish it because germs are germs and the natural flow of antibodies and immune systems must continue to evolve and we've become a society now we are where we're so particular about cleanliness mm -hmm. i mean doha in particular they mop pavements for crying out loud it's ridiculous the amount of cleaners that are out there to make sure that this place looks fantastic when half the time no one's walking on it i just think as a global society we're focusing too much on germs and cleanliness rather than letting nature take its course and the antibodies within our human bodies evolving to protect us. Where do we sit with something like COVID-19? How would you cope with this? Huh. Uh, again, I am the least Dr. qualified Jeffrey. person. Yeah, I'm the least qualified Dr. person. <laughs> do you know, this is, uh, I'm gonna give you a, a little story. So when you asked for my history, uh, I said, I was in Beirut and then we had a little time in Dubai then to, to London. So the reality was we were in Beirut. Everything I said is 100% true, but let me just add a bit more flavor to it. Uh, while I was in Beirut, we were evacuated from Beirut. It was the start, it was maybe a month or two into the second Gulf War in 2003. Uh, and we had a person come in with a bomb into HSBC's office in Hamra. For those uh, my Lebanese friends that are listening in, they'll probably remember it well. Uh, thankfully, it was the situation, and I'm, I'm greatly understating what actually happened, but thankfully the situation was taken care of during the same day with, with no loss of, of blood or no loss of life. Um, but we had a number of threats that we were being uh, advised of against the bank and against certain members of staff. And because of that, we evacuated certain personnel, and that was, for me, that was meant a few of us had moved to Dubai, and then we shuttled back and forth between Dubai and Beirut, and then eventually moved to London in September. Now, we did all of that, and nothing happened. Again, no one died. No one was shot. There were no bombings. Nothing happened. So we were accused by many of overreacting. And you think, okay, we'll never know. Did what, did what we do solve, uh, avoid a catastrophe? Right? My wife and kids uh, were out of the country at the time, just $2 at that stage. They were in Australia on holiday. They never went back to Beirut. They literally went on holiday and never went back again. Another whole story is how I managed to pack the house up uh, and left a number of things in Beirut, which I'm still uh, regretting. Uh, but the reality is, again, we evacuated. No one got hurt and moved on. And, and so we were accused again of, of, of vastly overreacting. And I used to say, you know, I really wish someone would take a shot at me, just miss me and hit the wall and go, see, there's the proof that we're at risk and now I'm leaving. And then, yeah, okay, great, yeah, I see that risk, now you're leaving, I get it. But without that, we, we never know. And the reality is, and your follow-up would, I'm sure would echo this, if given the risks that we we're being advised of, if the bank hadn't taken action and something horrible happened, then the effects to the bank and obviously on loss of life would be incredible, Flip. right? So you know what? To use my Russian, Yenis Nail, I don't know, right? And and so I look at the situation now. I think I think what you said at the beginning of your your comments was was so accurate, Simon. I think the, you know, the, whatever you do, you'll be criticized for. Uh, and um, and I think if you look at this, I think the states is a perfect example because despite what some people think. Uh, the press is exceptionally free. Uh, and so because the, state, the press is exceptionally free and the press has become incredibly polarized as it has in most countries, you do get one side saying, is it amazing how, you know, what a great job is being done. And then that another part of the press says that everything this person does is terrible. Well, neither are true. Um, and so you know what? We'll find out. And, and how, what, do I see, what do I see down the long term? You know, I'm, again, I'm not an expert. I'm not, not one to say, but I think if I look at Qatar specifically, I think the way that Qatar is managing the situation by doing incredible amounts of testing. Um, and I think the fact that the death rate in Qatar is so 
incredibly low and with great respect to people that obviously have lost family members but with a with a 12 fatalities to date um although every life is precious i think the fact that it's only been 12 is incredible uh so i think how it's being handled here is is fantastic um of course as a business person i would love everything to be wide open but that doesn't mean i'm campaigning for it uh, I leave these things to the experts and I really believe that in most places, and I do mean most, the science is being followed. The challenge is the science is not clear. Uh, and I think that's where, that's where everyone's struggling, is the science is just not clear enough and everyone's learning on a daily basis. I mean, I, you know, obviously we're on a podcast. Uh, I listen to The Economist podcast and a lot, particularly through this crisis. And, and uh, you just hear Mick, uh, it's... It's not, you know, you just hear mixed views, right? There's a lot of different views about how things are to be done. Um, and um, I think you find your path and you, and you go with it. But I would say it's best to err on the side of caution at this time. And I do, I do get concerned about certain individuals and countries that are opening up too quickly. You're damned if you do, and you're damned Absolutely. if you don't. And that's not just about the COVID-19 yep. situation. Yep. That is... Certainly, as as poli and I'm not a I'm not a massive fan of politicians. I hate the way they answer or don't answer questions. I wish someone would just turn around and and give uh, give the truth, even if it wasn't even if it's not what you want to hear. I think this is my philosophy of business. I'd rather tell a client the truth. Yeah, I'd rather tell them, look, this is wrong. This is why it's wrong. But oh, by the way, this is how we're going to fix it. Yeah. Why? Why? Do, well, I'll ask you the question because I, I don't know what your political beliefs are, but. I've never voted in my life. I, I, and the reason I didn't vote is I blame Victor Maine, my, my uh, modern studies teacher of politics. He said, there's no point. It's first past the post. Your vote doesn't count. And, you know, I just took after him. It didn't Good. make any sense. Good. Uh, but, you know, wh why do politicians not take the honest approach? I think I know the answer to this, and we'll come on to the answer in a second. Is it purely press, press uh, pressure? Let me ask you a question. Did Donald Trump tell people to drink disinfectant? <laughs> did, did he or did he not? Well, if it's on video. No, did he tell people? He didn't say to, drink it, no. He, he insinuated something about it. He said it's something we should look into. Yeah, he didn't say drink That it. is not telling people to drink it. No. But if you read no, certain some, parts Someone of the press, was in his ear. Someone would have been in his ear saying something. So, that he said. Was, so again, frankly, my wife and was, I have the same conversation about polit politicians. She's actually not, she's not, uh, she doesn't dislike Boris Johnson, but I wouldn't say she's a massive fan. She's yep. kind of neutral. Yep. But she said oh, oh, Boris Johnson didn't close the country in time. Hang on a second. Boris Johnson didn't make those decisions. The 150 advisors, scientists, uh, correspondents, whoever was in the background, cabinet, are all sitting there doing this in his ear, saying, do this, do that. Yep. No, don't do this because of that. Don't do this because of that. And then this one man or one person, Donald Trump included, has to make that decision. And damned if you do and damned if you don't. Some people yep. think it's right. Let's do the, the herded mentality. Let's get sick. Let's see who has the antibodies. Let's see who survives. And everyone can accust get accustomed to it, just like other, other illnesses over time. And by the time that happens, we'll have the relevant vaccine in 12 to 18 months. That's yep. how it started. That's how I see the UK and my mindset was, you know what? You're not going to stop this. You 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 may as well. You're not going to be able to completely protect this because it's so distinctively available to be transferred on surfaces via via sneezing, etc. Maybe it is the right way to go, but the the the, the this of um, the transfer of this virus is so potent yeah. that it's just it, you know, it's, it's virtually genocide. And, and would you, as a politician, want to make that decision? I, I think it's, I think it's, and these are some of the decisions It was actually, uh, I think it was Tony Blair, it was the first time I heard the phrase anyways, referred to that he makes kind of more horrible decisions by 10 a.m. every day. Uh, and I think that's correct. And I think I remember, I remember noticing with Tony Blair and I remember noticing with Barack Obama, just how quickly they lost their youthful look after becoming yes. leaders of their respective countries. Yeah. Um, just remarkable how quickly they aged and I, I cannot imagine the pressure. Well, T Theresa May wasn't exactly a youthful lady when she started, but I'll tell you something, she didn't do herself any favors by the time she finished. She was a very, she, she looked very, very downtrodden and uh, defeated 
uh, yep. lady, even though she was successful in, in the polls for a short yep. period of time. Anyway, yep. let's go back, so back to some more positive things. So we know that it's a negative situation, but we do know there's some opportunity out there. I'm certainly looking at things as an opportunity. But as I said to you sort of, uh, before we started the podcast, you are fairly active um, at the moment. You're very active as a company, Nelson Park Property, um, very award-winning, I hasten to add, uh, for several years. So massive congratulations Thank you. to you on that. Um, you guys are doing a, a fantastic job. You're, you're very active on social media, both with the properties and how you portray the business and, and the relevant properties on social media but you're actively supporting your team. How have the team found things over the past uh, six to seven weeks? You know, I, I, uh, I, I think what I always strive to do whenever we're doing any kind of social media, particularly where I'm personally involved, um, is I always want to be, like you referred to earlier, I always want to be as honest as possible. So I'm always very, very open and honest with my team. And, uh, and I asked them for them to, to, be, to be the same. What I, and deep down, although I, I may not always show it directly, I'm, I'm a very, very optimistic person, a very positive person, although I don't necessarily always show it. Uh, and what I would say, if I look at my team, I think they've done an incredible job. They really, really have. You know, one thing, when I look at, the sort of 11 years now of running Nelson Park, and if I compare that to the previous sort of 18 years of my banking career, and part of it's because I own the business, obviously, but the I've I've got to know my colleagues within Nelson Park clearly way way better than I got to know a lot of my colleagues when I was working for HSBC, and you know, a lot of what I've, what you realize the more and more you do things, the more you think about things is you get to know people and what's happening with their families and things that are going on. And what we may be seeing on a day-to-day -day basis with colleagues is, is often nothing compared to what's going on in the background. So I try my best and don't always succeed. In fact, often fail at this, try to understand what other things may be going on with them. Uh, and one thing I've said since the beginning of this current situation, I've always said to my team, um, I want you to do the very, very best you can in this current situation with what you're comfortable with. So in other words, I don't force any agent that you must go do a viewing and you must go doing it now. I let them choose uh, what it is that they're comfortable with. So obviously we have our rules and regulations we have to work under. Of course, those, that's the minimum beginning point. And then from a safety point, if they want to add on more levels, then, then by all means do it. I have some of my colleagues that are certain areas or certain things they don't, they're not comfortable with right now. And I let them. I let them work with that. Um, all I ask is that, and this is what I, the challenge I've been saying on a regular basis to my own team, is do not look back at this situation with regret. In other words, when this is all finished, that you look back and think, you know, I could have actually done more. I could have helped out more. So I really encourage them to make sure they're doing all the very best they can with what they feel comfortable with. Um, but if I look at the team, you know, I think. They, they've really done a phenomenal job. It was kind of Thursday after Thursday after Thursday, I think about four or five Thursdays in a row that there were kind of new regulations. Uh, and to be very frank, the regulations have been, um, haven't truly affected our business that much. In other words, uh, so 80% of staff are not, are supposed to be outside the office right now. That's the, one of the regulations. So all of our agents, you know, don't work from our office. So they're normally out with clients and things like that. So that actually is a natural for us. So often 90% of our staff are outside the office. So okay, well, that's perfect. Um, Ramadan hours are nine to three. We would normally work from, you know, say eight to five with a sort of a shifted, a split shift. But if it's nine to three, it's nine to three. Okay, we work with that. We normally open on Saturdays. Government regulations, are you closed on Saturdays? Okay, we're closed. So we can work with a lot of the regulations quite easily. And then it's just a case of safety when it comes to visiting with clients that we wear masks and gloves and we have an adequate supply of those for our team and we carry supplies for our clients in case they don't have them themselves. Um, but I've been incredibly impressed with people. Uh, I, you know, I think it's often the case when you'll talk to somebody, uh, you know, as in many things in life, there's sort of what you say and then there's actually what you do. And, and sometimes you'll, I'll be talking to a colleague and they'll be like, oh, this isn't great, this isn't great. And then the phone will ring and they go, great, I've got a viewing, I got to go. And thinking, you know, it's like, well, actually deep down, they're, 
again, quite positive and just need to go out and, and make it happen. Um, it, it, it is, you know, it's a challenge with, you know, kind of stuff that we just talked about with what's going on in the media and what you, what you can read from a daily basis. Um, it's, uh, it can be a challenge. And I think the, you know, what I always want to do again, portray to, to our clients, to our colleagues, to, to everyone that we work with is that we are very, very much open for business. Uh, it is a change market. We're doing all that we can and we appreciate the trust that, um, that our clients put, uh, put in us to, to do the best we can for them. Um, but I've always really been impressed with, with the team that we have. The team that we have today is the strongest team we've ever had. And the, the work that they do on a regular basis is incredible. Um, I, I see on social media, you're actually hiring at the moment. Yes. You've had at least two or three uh, four. new four yep. uh, on board in the last probably 10 days, according yep. to your social media. I mean, Correct. that's, that's going against the grain, surely. Yeah. Well, I, you know, it's funny you mentioned that because of a, an ill-advised teacher that taught you not that for some ridiculous reason told you not to vote. Um, the, uh, <laughs> oh, thankfully, God rest his soul. He's actually passed on, but he was a lovely uh, man. But, well, yeah. indeed, indeed. Uh, so, one of my teachers who also has passed away many years ago, he always said that um, when things are difficult, increase your marketing budget. Mm -hmm. um, and, and again, we've all read that, we've all heard it, right? Most companies we know do not, most companies shrink. And so what we've done on all levels is we've maintained or increased what we're doing. Um, and when it comes to recruiting staff, we are always in the market for looking for good, we are always in the market to hire good people. It's a big market. There's a lot of room for growth. There's a lot of room for our, our company to grow. And when there are, uh, when there, when there is an opportunity to hire good people, I'll always look to take it. Um, and frankly, and hopefully I can say this with confidence, but not arrogance. Um, this is probably more of a banking phrase, which I'll bring into Nelson Park, uh, which I often do much to the chagrin of most of my colleagues uh, <laughs> in difficult times, people flight to, you know, flee to quality. Uh, and we see that within HSBC in my time there, is when things were difficult, people would move their money to HSBC, to a good, strong global bank. Uh, and I'm sure your father-in-law would echo that comment. Uh, and I think if I look at what we're doing, we like to see, and we've often seen a flight to quality. And so we will always be looking to work with new, new people, new tenants, new buyers, sellers, landlords, and we'll look to attract good people to our company. And um, we feel that, you know, when things are in this kind of situation, that's, that's what we see happen. And if we have an opportunity to bring someone really good to our team, then we'll, we'll look to take it. Um, oh, kudos to mean, you. Um, thank you. Thank you very much. It's, uh, I've, I've seen, I've seen the, the sort of the growth and the evolution of your business firsthand and, and within our, so we've done a couple of projects together from a, from a BGI perspective. We've, um, we, we've done the, the furnishing of your main office. Yep. Um, I think the furniture and the chairs are still going strong, which is good. Yep. I often see your uh, your presentations to your team, uh, which is fantastic. And uh, also the, the wonderful uh, uh, project experience that we had uh, yes. down at your, your second location. Um, that was interesting. It was it? indeed. Indeed. It was yes. a long, long process. And yep. uh, I'm, I'm sure you won't mind me saying, but you know, we will always be friends uh, we, we've always got respect for one another we we often have our venting phone calls which we haven't actually had for some no, time I must, indeed. I must say it's been a while and we, won't, and we won't do it on here <laughs> let's keep it clean but we often have a phone call and it's either me venting at you or you venting at me about something uh, that's gone on um, but th th we need that you know we need that people around us within the SME community you know if it's uh, um, if it's not internal, that you need the external uh, SME business owners to understand what we're what we're going through. And I remember when we went through this process, we had those conversations at which it was, well, why is this happening? You know, this is a very small to put a context around it yep. for the listeners. It's a small uh, site. It's a yep. small project. Just fifty square um, meters. Yeah. Yeah, in, in on the pearl, but the process that we had to go through of something that had already been fitted out. And actually retest and redesign and resubmit and wait and wait and wait and then get the civil defense involved and then get the municipality. You know, there was a reason why they gave you a grace period of that of that length. Yep. And that's something that I take as a challenge. I take it as a challenge in which I'm trying to reduce that time scale. 
I'm trying to reduce that process. But what made and what makes our relationship is that that phone call that we touched on. I remember sitting, having a nice beverage, and I get uh, Jeffrey Asselstein calling me and picks up the phone, and the words were to the extent of, now I get it. Now I understand what you went through, and I should really apologize, but I'm not gonna. And I think, it was, a th I think it was a Thursday, actually, um, because I was in uh, having a, a social beverage, and I remember laughing, and we just laughed about it, but at least yeah. it's been successful. How, how have you found the second location? I mean, the whole purpose was to make your business more efficient, because a lot of your viewings are down that side of town. Well, indeed. And I think it's, well, for us, it's been a huge success. Um, Good. Like a lot of situations when you move into it, I just wish I would have done it earlier. Um, Hindsight. Yeah. Hindsight's it, a great thing. It, well, indeed. You know, and so, um, I'm, you know, I think actually financially, it, it, it was absolutely the right time for us. In other words, we probably didn't have, the, we certainly had the financial strength to go into the project when we knew we could pay cash and get it done and, and, uh, and pay, well, frankly, pay you, pay our bills on time and, and, and get it done without having to worry. Um, probably two or three years before, we wouldn't have had the comfort, or, or as a friend of mine calls it, the cash flow confidence to do that. So it probably was actually the right time for us. And I think it's, um, it, it, it gave us a boost internally. I think there's nothing better than to be working for a company which is growing, hence the, again, recruitment of staff, that's growing and doing new things and looking to expand. Um, you know, I. I I've always strongly, strongly believed that that people are attracted, both, you know, colleagues and, and clients are attracted to companies they see doing well. It's it's kind of obvious, but it's 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 the reality. So, you know, for us, the the great benefit, and it it some may sound like a silly thing to bring up. It's one the, probably the biggest benefit is one we didn't anticipate, which is this, just the simple fact that the keys that we have for apartments, we have to keep in a safe place. And we would keep them in our office and sell the road. And so if a, one of our agents had a viewing on the Pearl, they'd come and collect, let's say, two or three sets of keys for two bedrooms in the Pearl. And they'd be doing the viewings and the client would say, oh, these are great, but the budget or the space isn't quite our size. What do you have for three bedrooms? And the agent goes, oh, knowing that the keys are 45 minutes back at the road, 25 minutes to get back, it's going to be at least an hour before I can get the keys back and the office is closing soon. And so we'd, just the fact of having the keys in the Pearl office made the budget make sense. And it was well, complete. I'm sure you could quantify the time and yeah. efficiency. And, and listen, time you can never get back. And I'm focusing yep. so much on time and efficiency. And uh, as we spoke about processes, multinationals and government entities, if they can reduce their processes and their time by 20%, yep. that's a huge amount of monetary value Absolutely. across the board. And what you have done is exactly that. You have taken a problem, you've solved the problem internally, albeit, yeah. but you're quantifying that in saving the time, which means more viewings can happen, less issues are happening with regards to um, the, the request from a two bed to a three bed, because instead of having an hour round trip, you've got 10 minutes. Exactly. And again, in full disclosure, not part of my project plan. That was not part <laughs> of the benefit. It was just a, it was just a reality but we didn't really think it would have that. I mean, it just never entered my mind. And but then are, you, we, are you benefiting from the original business case about the exposure oh, for having a, having a site on the problem? Absolutely. So it's, you know, having a place to meet clients often, you know, you don't really meet clients in the office just by nature because you tend to be out looking at the property and doing things. So mm -hmm. uh, that's very natural that you're not in an office set up for the meetings because you're, you're viewing property. But at the end of the viewings, where if there's something to be signed, checks to be handed over, it's far more professional that we're able to do it in our office as opposed to doing it in a coffee shop. Um, yes. And it just gives, you know, it's, it's the right impression, it's the right thing to do. And, you know, for our team to have access to printers, to colleagues, to a meeting place, to a place to come in and have a coffee with a client. And yeah. in fact, actually, as you know, I tend to work from both locations. Um, so when I speak to a client, they say, where's your office? And I'll say, well, I have two. I can meet you in Solo Road. I can meet you in the Pearl. Which do you prefer? Uh, and having that flexibility is great. And because, you know, we'll have people that live on the Pearl. So I'm on the Pearl. So I go down um, or I'll come across. Um, and, you know, there have been, you know, we've got a, a large team. So I'm sure if I talk to my agents right now, they could tell me story after story of, of just the great benefit of being close by. And I know I've had one where, 
I was sitting in the office and I get a call from somebody um, who said, I want to view this property. Where's your office? I offer them two options. He goes, well, I work on Sala Road. So well, that's where my office is, but I'm in the pool right now. He goes, well, I'll come to you. He comes to us. I'm in the office. I've got the keys. We go and view the property. And literally we agreed the deal in 15 minutes. Now, <laughs> you know, before that wouldn't have been possible. And it doesn't happen every time, but it's having, you know, I, I can't remember the quote, but it's something that, you know, luck is like when opportunity meets preparedness or something like that, right? Is that is preparation, I think. Yeah, preparation, like yeah. yeah. So, you know, so the opportunity was there, but we have the office, we had the keys and I'm available and it lined up and we got, you know, we're able to make the client very, very happy as a result. So it, it, um, it's a, my only probably wish is that we had done it earlier. Um, but uh, having said that, probably was the right timing for us. But um, it's, it's done now. And the, yeah. I'm going to give you a mini wrap on the knuckles. And I've just thought of this because I see your social media daily and you're, yep. you're so consistent with the social media. Okay. You're very, very good at promoting the properties that you have, but I haven't actually seen a fantastic image of the marina outside your window from the location that we've just discussed. All right. Because the promotion of the fact that you have an office on the Pearl is as important to the properties that you have on the Pearl themselves. Okay, so when, when, does, the, when does this podcast go out? It can, it go, it'll go out uh, next week. So okay, so I will, promise, I will promise you right now that before it goes out, <laughs> I will rectify that. So as I'm going uh, to put it as, a, as like a, a, an ending. Challenge. As a result of the podcast, this happened. Yep. And I'll put a picture at the end. <laughs> Con consider it done. Consider it done. You've taken my advice on board. Thank you, yep. sir. Thank you. My no, pleasure. Seriously, it's, the whole point of it being there was to show people that you have that facility. Yep. Unless you're talking to someone in the market and they don't know that, then the social media is your audience. And you've got a fantastic audience, and, and I am one of them. Thank, uh, and thank you. And you've got a fantastic team, of, of, uh, of which I know I know a few of the teams, um, Ashlyn and uh, uh, Gary. Right. Right, right. Uh, is, is still with you. You your, know, it's interesting. Model, your famous models of your social media. Indeed. I was, <laughs> the, uh, I, I was listening to a podcast last night, and it was interesting what it said. It, it, was, it was talking about from a management perspective, but I'll put it back to a social media perspective. And it was saying that, you know, as leaders of our teams, um, you need to constantly repeat the same messages and to ground them. Consistency. Yeah, be consistent, repeat the same message, really drive it home and really make sure it's, it's clear. And, and I, I know I do that. And, and sometimes in doing it, I'm thinking, man, I'm saying the same thing again. I wonder if people are bored by it. And I'm sure there are some that are bored by it, but it's regardless of getting bored by it or not, you have to constantly drive in the same messages. And so why I'm saying that in relative to social media, um, you, we, you know, as those who provide the content, sometimes we forget. So everything you're saying right now about the, the, the location is absolutely true. That's why I wrote it down to challenge myself to do it. Now we would have done that two and a half years ago when we opened, but it's something that we can continually remind people of. And I think there's always a need to continuously go back to those first principles and remind people of uh, some of the key things that maybe, maybe because we know it inside the company, maybe we forget to, to reinforce it. So I appreciate that you, you've raised that and I'll, uh, I'll sort it by the weekend. Good man. Yeah. I told you time would fly, so let's try and You're wrap right. this up. There's still a couple of things that I wanted to chat to you about. So let's talk about property. So I'm gonna ask you a very direct question. Why would sure. someone buy on the Pearl? So let me ask, I'll just, are you referring to an expatriate or a Qatari? I'll just Let's go an expatriate because we're okay. spending so much money in our terms on rent. I've yep. got a friend of mine that's lived in the same apartment for nearly seven years, I think, and yep. he could have bought it by now. Yep. And he's just kind of banging his head against a brick wall. What, what's the opportunities for expats to buy and why would they? So probably the number one reason you just actually given. Oh. So what's, what's really, what, yeah, no, what's, what's really interesting uh, is, um, well, what, what's interesting is it's the maturing of the market, right? So, Probably even when you and I came, even, even 10 years ago, a lot of expats would have looked at Qatar, and, and the numbers still quite a few do now, but, but it's the maturing of the market I'm getting to. So a lot of expats would look at, you know, coming to Qatar as a, as a posting, you know, and if you, if you come with a, cor a large corporate, that is often the case, right? If you come with, 
you know, a certain bank. You come, you do it three or four years, then you leave. Um, and they look at it as a post. You come with Exxon Mobil, you come two, three or four years, they give you accommodation, and then you leave. It but there's a huge, seen. right. And, and, you know, some of the, you know, a lot of the, the, the internationals. But if you, but there's a large part of the population, guys like us are, are part of this, that are here longer term and uh, may, well, as I did, switch companies and switch businesses. And as you've, you know, had different entities that you've worked with and, and have run. So we're, we're here for a longer period of time. We see ourselves more as part of the community. So then you actually get back to the same kind of issues you would have in Scotland or I'd have in Canada, which is, you know, I'm kind of tired of paying rent. Why don't I invest in my own property as opposed, as opposed to paying a landlord? So for a lot of owners, that's, um, that is a, a big consideration. So I'm getting more and more people now as expatriates saying that to me than I've ever had before, which is I'm tired of paying rent. I'd rather own it myself. I would say even 10 years ago when we started the company, we didn't have that conversation very often. It was more, is it a good investment? As opposed to, I just don't want to pay rent anymore. So At the end of the day, the rent is, is going in somebody else's pocket. So even if you sure. weren't making any money on the capital gains and you're paying off a mortgage, when you eventually sell it, you get that rent back. Yeah, you get that exactly. mortgage payment back. So, so it's, that, a, it's a positive in that respect. Yeah, so that'd be kind of the, the number one reason. And then I think number two, uh, and, and sort of, Number two, three, and kind of becomes a longer tail. I think, um, you know, I think the, the, the fundamentals of Qatar long term are very strong. And this is my sort of economics background kicking in. And I know, we know, I know where oil price is today, and it's not amazing, but I still think the long term fundamentals of Qatar are very, very strong indeed. So I've, I'm, a long, I'm a believer in the long term future of Qatar. With the new uh, gas at, trains that are uh, the new gas trains and the, the, um, the expansion to, uh, to 100 billion tons um, yep. is is going to be uh is going to kick on the economy here so there's no i don't right. see any issues world cup or no world cup this place is well that is a, you, is a you literally read my mind i was going to say you know the world cup's gonna be a fantastic event six weeks two years from now um and i think it'd be amazing it's it's kick-started all the, a lot of infrastructure that we needed anyway so that yeah, that's a great benefit them. so but so for the for the for the expatriate investor again so number one you know tired of paying rent and, and just number two there's a, a a good steady demand from tenants be because the vast majority of people in the country rent the vast, vast, vast majority. You have a constant stream of tenants that need a place to live. Uh, for those who remember Maslow's hierarchy of needs from psych 101, number one is security, safety, shelter, right? So everyone needs a place to live. It's a wonderful thing. If you're a landlord that you have a constant demand from, from clients. Uh, and then I'll probably put it as number three, but maybe it's number two is the tax regime in Qatar is unbelievable. There are no capital gains tax and there's no personal income tax. So I, I don't, you know, I come from a country that's fairly highly taxed. Uh, you come from a, a country which is less taxed than Canada, but higher tax than Qatar. So the tax benefits of investing in Qatar are incredible. Zero capital gains and zero personal income tax. That's compelling, right? Yeah. You're not gonna lose 25% of your rental income in tax. Right. And that's, hard, that's very, very, very compelling. On, hardest part must be for expats getting on the property ladder because the, yep. the facilities that are available for expats are obviously nowhere near uh, those of, uh, of local Qataris. Uh, what are the options? What are the uh, basic options? Yeah, to be honest, it, it's slightly more difficult, uh, but, but not a, it's, it's not a massive difference, but slightly more difficult. Um, but right now in the market, um, what has really been encouraging, uh, and, and I... We'll do a bit of a shameless plug, but not too much. Uh, there are a number of options for, um, for buyers to do either lease to own situation where they can rent, they can rent, agree to rent a property for three years and then eventually buy it. Uh, and a number of developers, including one we just launched yesterday, are offering a seven year payment plan. Now, um, you know, developers offering a payment plan is great. You know, and if, if a developer offers a three year payment plan, that's great, but three years is very, very, quick to pay off a property, you know, so you got fairly high payments, but you know, some now are five and one we just launched yesterday again is seven years. You know, that's, that's pretty good. Um, so be able to buy a property on a payment plan without having to tap into bank finance. That's really encouraging. And uh, so I think that is there. And obviously banks do lend, certainly the local banks do lend to expatriates to buy property. Um, so there are, there are a number of where, options to do that. Where, where are those developments, by the way? <laughs> Uh, so the one in particular is are in Lucille that uh, yeah. 
I'll send you the details over. So basically, the few developments in New Sale right now where there's up to seven year payment plans um, that are available to, to, to customers, both expatriates and Qataris, with, with no difference in pricing or the terms and conditions. So I think it is, it is a really compelling thing for people to have a look at down the line. Yeah. That's good. That's good. Let's finish off with uh, a little touch on um, modern day business and how you think that might change given the, given the scenario. Now, we had a very, very brief chat uh, offline and I was interested at your reaction. So let's just, let's just reset it. I think the modern day office will change. I don't think it will be completely eradicated from SMEs nor from MEs. I think SMEs and home working and remote working is probably the best way to put it, and co-working and collaboration spaces will, um, will spike. I think the need for smaller offices and the Regis type offices will also increase versus uh, the larger office spaces. I think office spaces will become uh, more compact because of the collaboration, hot desking, and the opportunity for flexible working hours. But from a real estate perspective, the amount of time, which again you touched on about the Salva versus, versus the Pearl branch, yep. the time that this is being spent on visits, on viewings, from property to property to property, and people have particular taste and they want to see if the furniture is going to fit. Do you not think that technology is well overdue in actually helping real estate companies to do virtual tours? and then minimize that actual physical visits, especially people that are expats that are moving from country to country and ended up spending a month to three months in a hotel or service accommodation until such time as they find somewhere to live. Where do you think technology is going to go um, within real estate and how do you think the office uh, in general will change with COVID? Yeah, I think it's, um, so if I look at real estate in particular, I think, you know, if, if we look at say the last 11 years since we've been in business, obviously, if we just look at our website, so on our website, we have all the properties that we have available that are online, clients can look at that. Now that may not sound that, that groundbreaking, but you know, even 10 years ago, it wasn't that easy, certainly in this market, uh, to actually be able to look at property. When we arrived 13 years ago, I don't know if any real estate company really had their listings online. So having listings online uh, is a huge benefit to, uh, and a huge change over say from, from 10 years ago. Um, and with the current situation, obviously we're sending a lot more photos via WhatsApp, via WhatsApp sending videos. So we're sharing a lot more information with clients, um, you know, just through technology. And I think that will, I think that will continue to be the case and needs to be the case. Um, however, and I don't want to be a Luddite here, but I strongly believe that there will always be for the, certainly for the, for, the, for the future that I can see. I was speaking to someone the other day and they said, you know, with, with all the changes of what's going on, all you need is you need it all online and then the client can just walk in, you know, at the very last minute, walk in, look at the property, go, yep, it is what you showed me, great, thank you very much, and sign. I don't see that happening. It can happen. In fact, it does happen today. But I think the reality is, and again, I, I don't want to be ridiculous about it, but I think when it comes to what is clearly, if you're renting, it is your largest expense, right? That's your largest expense, the amount of rent that you're paying every month. If you buy a place to live in, it'll be your largest investment. Now, I'm separating kind of property investor, but if you're buying a home to live in, it's probably your, people say it's the best investment I've ever made. It's often the only investment people make, but it's certainly the largest that most people will make will be on their property. So when it comes down to that biggest share of their discretionary income or the biggest share of their investment income going to a property, there will, I feel there will always be a desire to see it and to, to be part of it. And from my own experience, you can see it all and view it all. And when you actually go to the property, We've had so many cases. In fact, I'll actually ask my team this all the time. This is pre-COVID-19, and I don't think it would change. I would ask my team all the time, what percentage of your customers call you about an advertisement? So in other words, call you about a listing, and then end up taking that listing. So not just of anyone that calls. Of those that call you and we rent a property to the client, how many 
times or how frequently does the client take the property that you showed to them? The first one that they asked for. Extremely rare. Extremely rare. So somebody will say, okay, I see that one bed in Tower 8. Can I go see it? Yeah. We show it to them. What else do you have? And we'll show a few others. And it's very, very, very exceptional that the client would actually take the first property or the property that they called about. Very, very rare. And so when I look at do I see it moving? Yeah, of course it's going to move forward. There'll be more viewings. There'll be more videos being shared. We're doing a lot more videos than we've ever done. There'll be a lot more of that in the future, without a doubt. And it, it needs to change, and it will, and it continues to change. But I think there will always be a large desire from homeowners or tenants to physically see the property. Then often once they see it, it'll change their view. Okay. And um, I mean, have you, I'll just ask you the question. I, I mean, I'm, you and I have known each other for quite a long time. You've moved a few times since I've known you. And I'm sure between yourself and your wife, you might see something online, you go and see it and you go, well, that's not quite what I thought it was. I thought the view was better. Oh, it's actually way better than I thought it was. Right. Uh, so I think that'll be, that'll be the interesting part. Um, I have a wry smile on my face because I, I agree with what you're saying, but I'm going to take it offline. I, okay. I, think, I think there's something that we can do that's going to possibly change your mind. Okay. Well, so I mean, if, before we do that, I'll just say, do I think that things need to change? I, I do. But I just think when it comes down to the final decision, there'll often be a need. I Something think it's like still that, a very say, strong It's a need. large investment. It's a large expense. It's, it's down to emotion as well. You know, the yep. physicality, they want to touch it. They want to see it. That, that, yep. You're never going to remove that. It's about yep. time and efficiency. It's about yep. how can we take people who are working um, 12 hour days, uh, the majority of the time and then they have to go and see five or six properties and they get frustrated because it's not what they thought it was going to be if you yep. can hold that meeting with them and show them five or six properties in a certain scenario that gives them 80 percent of the information to reduce down the number of visits that they do and of course the number of visits that your agents do you've yep. already gone one step with yep. having the second the second uh, uh, office Yep. in which you're reducing down that time. If you reduce that down even further, sure. the frequency of those, or the, I think the sales cycle, the, the, the lease cycle that, that your team are looking to, you know, looking to improve, um, and the productivity, you know, lack of wasted time, lack of wasted uh, efforts with people that are window shopping, no pun intended, yep. Yep. I think would, would still be of, of benefit. It's the adaptability yep. of the customers of them seeing technology as a benefit rather than a hindrance. Mm. You know, it's a, I had a, I had a conversation with my father yesterday and my father is, he's relatively young in the grand scheme of things. Um, but he's, he's of a generation where well, let me pay off my mortgage and, and I've, and I've done my, my duty to society. Yep. Whereas we've got a situation within our family where the estate, it could be eaten up by, you know, when, when family get older and they may go into nursing homes and things like this, then the estate is eaten up by, uh, by the private housing care that these people are needed, that, 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 that they require, excuse me. So the scenario has now changed where, you know, my father was very much a let's pay this off and that's my mortgage and my equity sits there to hang on a second. I've spent the last 30 years, 40 years, busting my backside and the government's going to come away or the private, you know, nursing sector is going to take my my hard-earned equity for me to see out the final years of my life. No, 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 no yeah. that's not happening. So sure. people will change. It yeah. requires something fundamental and historical, like the situation that we've got now, where Zoom calls, video calls were available. Technology of virtual tours is available. But I still think you're not going to see a 100% drop-off or an 80% drop-off of video calls in business when things eventually open. I think people are going to actually think, hang on a second, why am I driving to the other side of town to have a catch-up over a cup of coffee when I can do this and I'll make my own cup of coffee and they can make their cup of coffee? The only people that will suffer is coffee shops. Yeah, <laughs> yeah but they'll, they'll still have yeah, real, yeah. regular custom. Why am I jumping on a plane to London from Aberdeen? or from uh, Dubai to, to Doha and vice versa, not so easy now. Or why am I looking after the, 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 sort of the North Africa region and flying uh, all around the GCC and, and North Africa region when I can do my basic maintenance of my job from the comfort of my office or my home? 
So I do think that technology has actually gained, I think it's benefited from, uh, an opportunity has benefited from, from what has happened. As I say, that disclaimer of it's a, a yep. tragic thing that's happening in over 100 countries around the world. But it's, if anything, it's been a kick up the backside for evolution, I, I think. Um, and I do think that there will be some adaptation, but it will never get rid of the norm. It will never get rid of the physicality yep. that people want with networking events. Online events, webinars, fantastic. Nothing beats having a glass of wine and chatting to someone that you haven't seen for a few months at a networking event. Yep. It's just general socializing and networking. It's, it's what we are about as business yep. people. We can't always do this. But I think it'll, half the time it will be this and half the time it will be uh, the physicality. Yep. I think you make a very valid point. I think the, um, I mean, just, uh, you know, in all seriousness, if we go back to the project that we were working on, if you could imagine the citizen, Jeff, why don't we hop, let's hop on a Zoom call with, with one of your colleagues and the three of us are there, we can just discuss it and you can pick up the body language, you can see the tone. And I think that, you know, if that was to happen today, that's what we would do. Yes. Uh, for, so I think, I think that side of things, I think people are really craving the, uh, the personal interaction that's now missing. Um, and so I, I, I say when we spoke offline uh, prior, um, I, I think some of the predictions of how things will change are probably being a bit overblown. Um, yes. But uh, I think the examples you give for things like going across town just to have a coffee, beyond just the desire to strengthen a relationship, I think there are a lot of times that issues could be picked up and could be covered off when you can actually do a Zoom because you'd pick up on that, that side of things. I mean, I've, I've never actually been a big fan of doing things on Skype or calling friends and stuff like that, but actually that's, that's changed because it's now such a common part of what we do. I'd be much more comfortable in doing that now. Um, but I do, I do think people miss a lot of the, uh, you know, miss a lot of the personal interaction that you get. Um, I know I have my team meeting every Sunday morning and normally that's a meeting with 35 people and we still have it, but it's by Zoom. And it's good, it's effective, it's useful. I still think it's probably about half as useful as a face-to-face -face for that scenario. Yeah. And I'm probably being generous. Yeah, it'll, have, it'll have a purpose. Yeah. If you, if, you need to, if you need to get some quick decisions and you don't necessarily need to waste time pulling six or seven people together, um, it's certainly useful for me because I'm running projects that are, we've got stakeholders in Europe and Dubai yeah. and possibly in, in the US, but you know, time zone permitting, uh, I think it's, uh, it's, it's definitely going to be useful. Yep. Jeff, I did tell you that it was going to fly by. It does. You know, we have these conversations all the time. Um, can't thank you enough. You know, let's keep the rest for, for another episode. Um, sure. But just to finish off, how can people uh, get a hold of you? And where is that amazing location on the Pearl? Yeah. So our amazing location designed and constructed by the good people at BGI is, uh, is in Port Arabia, effectively between Towers and Lebanon Tower, between Tower 11 and 12, uh, right on the marina. So... If you know where Shakespeare & Co is, it's next door to Shakespeare & Co. So that's where our office is there. We have an office in Selwa Road. Um, you can reach, on our website, reach us on our website at nelsonparkproperty.com. And our main number is 5551-7567. So 5551-7567, yeah. Make sure you get those pictures up on social media. So right. Share those okay. images of the location and the marina with me and I'll put them on on, uh, on the thumbnails on, on YouTube. Sounds uh, good. So people can get the context of your location. Um, Jeffrey Asselstein, my pleasure. Pleasure, Thank you Simon. very much for being on This Is Qatar. We'll see you again soon. This will be released next week. Take care. Take care now. Bye-bye.